Let me start uh, with, with a quick introduction as we are covering uh, uh, the equity, credit, co-investment, secondaries uh, side uh, among the participants of this panel. Let me start with uh, the find, founding father of uh, Manulife's uh, infrastructure business, John Anderson, who traveled across the sea. He could do that. We yes. cannot do it until early November, <laughs> but uh, welcome to Europe. Thank you very much, Gordon. And yes, John Anderson, and I'll, I'll note Ed's comment about how our, we're still in kind of lockdown thinking. I found myself wondering if I can really still wear the same shirt three days in a row, but I did put on a clean shirt for you today, Gordon, so I'm, I'm getting back to normal. Um, yeah, so John Anderson at Manulife, um, we have an $8 billion um, U.S. direct investing equity fund um, that we manage, and then also I'm responsible for another six billion of infra equity in Manulife's fund and co-invest program. That's big focus in North America, but we also invest in Europe, Australia, around the world. And then separately, I have a $40 billion infrastructure debt program that rolls up to me as well. And then on the European side, Dominic Hanshaven from, from HSBC, you are doing not just uh, equi direct equity, co-invest, secondaries, uh, so the whole Bazaar, if I can put that. Uh, please uh, tell us the angle you are coming from. Just uh, for the organizer, I think the photo you put up there for me, that's not me. So at least it doesn't look like me. But anyway, <laughs> I am Dominic, so. <laughs> you can verify. You look much younger. Yeah, <laughs> I look much younger, yes. So my name is Dominic von Schieven. I work for HSBC. I'm part of the alternative investment team uh, looking after infrastructure equity investments. And as Gordon said already, my focus is very much on co-investments, secondaries, as well as uh, fund investments. And we deploy, on average, in a year, about 300 to 500 million in, into that sector. Thank you very much, Dominic. And certainly coming from the debt corner, uh, Klaus Finzen, who is the chief investment officer of the Allianz Global Investors uh, business. And so his focus is more on the fixed income side of infrastructure, Klaus. Correct, yes. So I run the infrastructure debt platform at Allianz Global Investors. Um, yeah, we invest predominantly in Europe, in the Americas, uh, roughly 18.5 billion now, from anything from triple A down to, to single B. Thank you very much. So just to get started, uh, what else could we talk about in this environment then? What is the post-COVID view for infrastructure? And uh, infrastructure, for, for the infrastructure, asset class, this is probably the first real crisis, because at the time of GFC, it was a very early, small, not even a full asset class. But the original promise was that infrastructure will be looking through short-term crises, it will be non-GDP correlated, inflation protected, uh, uh, a safe haven in, in times of trouble. So this was the real test, the first real test, what happened in COVID. And everybody in the world talks about a K-shaped recovery uh, in every aspect, be it among regions, uh, industries, uh, um, nations. But I think it's also true for, for infrastructure. Uh, certain different types of themes, strategies, asset categories within infrastructure are recovering or behaving post-COVID differently. So maybe the, uh, the first and provocative yeah. question, and we could talk hours about it, but can you just very briefly pick a winner and a loser uh, in your mind uh, yeah. in this post-COVID environment, looking forward, not what happened in the last two years, mm -hmm. what's going to happen in the next few years. Mm -hmm. John, why didn't you? So quickly, I'd say, you know, the overall asset class did exactly what we wanted it to do. So I think that was a good a win for the strategy collectively. I think also um, going forward, digital and uh, climate change solutions really jumped to the fore very much fitting with what we lived through last year. Um, I think um, for winners in the current market, I think I like um, build versus buy in terms of that, where are we in the cycle, the build stage or the buy stage. Um, so I think willing to take more development risk in order to get at attractive economics. And, and for me, Gordon, I think the, the big loser was um, natural gas fired generation. Um, and that's more of a North American comment, but pipelines and gas-fired power plants were a pretty big piece or a significant piece of many North American portfolios, and they were certainly very stressed. And uh, with the cloud 
over fossil fuels in energy transition, I think you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in that space. In, in, even with the, with the incredible surge in, in gas prices happening, for example, in Europe? Yeah, I think it's, and, and yet institutional investors tell me, don't put me into anything gas-fired, even though that's 25% of the energy supply uh, in North America and critical to getting off of coal. So I, I really, we, among many investors, we wonder, will there be tremendous profits for hedge funds willing to invest in um, natural gas as a transition fuel and all the institutional investors sit on their hands because their boards don't want to participate in that sector of the market. I, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Okay, interesting takeaway for the audience, uh, number one. Number two, uh, Dominic, what are your... I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of them already. I think the one missing is clearly the telecom sector or the digital sector really picked up. And uh, I can see that in my portfolio. We invested very early on in, in, uh, in that sector, but also renewables is really picking up, valuation is picking up. So. I think that's definitely a winner. A loser is, in general, you mentioned it, energy focused on midstream, upstream, that's challenging. Um, another winner going forward is the whole energy transition. Um, I think there's lots, lots of talk around um, hydrogen. Let's see whether that happens, whether it kicks off. Um, it still depends a lot on subsidies. Um, but that's an interesting area to look at. But for me specifically, also what's interesting is that the whole infrasecondary market really picks up. Um, people thinking about solutions. I'm not quite sure if there's a correlation between the current crisis or not, but I think the, you definitely see more momentum. You see people looking for liquidity solutions, and there's also a big jump into um, yield-focused assets, i.e. core or super core, however you want to name it, but um, focus on yield is also another big thing. Second, as you mentioned, is it driven more by the LP side or the GP side? I think it's driven uh, by both. So I think the inventory of secondary is building up, so more funds are being raised, and that needs to be exited at one point. So you can either do directly or you sell portfolios. People are reshuffling, or LPs are reshuffling their portfolio. Some of them want to focus more on core, less so on value add. There are also some legacy positions. So I think the inventory is just naturally building up, and clearly it's also driven by GPs. Um, and, uh, and I think Infra was one of the first with uh, sort of GP-led transactions, and now it's been picked up as well by, by our, our colleagues from the PE side. But I think it kind of makes sense in the Infra world because the assets just live longer than the fun term. So um, I think it's a natural evolution to look at that as well. Thank you. Klaus, from your angle. Yeah, a lot has been said. I think, I mean, in our book, I would say um, similar, obviously, the, the digital is, is much more in the forefront right now, although I find it um, it's probably more a shorter time duration as a class, especially if you look at fiber. So not necessarily a core as a class as such, right now, will develop into some. Um, also, we have, we have mentioned climate. Um, what I find interesting is that we see increasingly, in, initially it was just green, right? And people wanting to buy, buy effectively uh, sustainable investments, green investments. But I find that now the market realizes that that is not sufficient. Um, that we need to look at transformational finance. So we need to look at actually gas or coal and try and um, put a debt pack, well, I'm talking from the debt side, a debt package on which, you know, with additional covenants which, which supports effectively the transformation away from coal, away from fossil fuels um, into potentially renewables. And, and talking to our investors, there's an increasing willingness to look at that. Um, whereas in the two, for two years ago, it was different. It was purely looking at renewables and, and, and green assets. So that's, that's a positive development, in my view. Um, losers, um, I think the book has really held up well. I mean, we only had one downgrade of a toll road, uh, a low investment grade, which we think is temporary, uh, Spanish road. But everything else is still you know, performing well. And we, I think we are encouraged by what we've seen on the toll road sector. Clearly, airports are challenged. Uh, will be challenged for some time. Um, but in general, I think the asset class has really um, proven what, what we always said, right? It's a very stable asset class over, over different crises, and, and um, it's encouraging. 
and with your debt outlook, uh, I mean, Allianz is, is known for investing often in 20-year bonds or, or beyond that. Uh, with all the technological change or the structural change in energy uh, uh, production, uh, how, how, how do you price that risk? <laughs> Well, there's a lot of crystal balls we need in our business, I guess. Um, you know, there's a lot of time right now spent on, you know, stranded assets. How will especially the energy market transform? And, and you know, the questions coming up, we see, you know, merchant tails and renewables, you know, can we do this? Is this safe to do, especially in wind? Um, we see, obviously, you know, how long do we want to finance fossil fuels? Um, and we have certain certain limitations in terms of duration we can offer there, but it's, it's very much a moving target and it almost changes by, by the minute, right? I mean, a year ago it was already a different discussion and I think now the additional regulatory requirements, and I think there are sessions about this here as well, the regulatory requirements we have, you know, SFDR in the Article 8, 9, you know, Article 7, um, principal adverse impact on, on our end, on the private market side, a huge challenge massive challenge to, to get the information um, and especially on the debt side where you on the existing book have zero covenants to actually ask for that information you're, you're sort of dependent on on, um, on investors or issuers being willing to provide that information so yeah a lot of changes. If I could build on Gordon I think it's very powerful Klaus that you're financing the energy transition I think that can be so important to the overall market I think of as a lender you could look at a gas-fired power plant and say, I know this has an important role for the next 10 years, and I can finance that and get principal and interest back over that 10-year period. It's so hard for an equity investor to say, 10 years out, what's the next 10 years worth? But if we have capital sources financing the transition and taking that medium term, um, supporting that critical role in the medium term, I think that's very powerful for the market. So the terminal value becomes an issue. Yeah, that's where we get yeah. kind of jammed, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a perfect segue into the next topic um, that I wanted to raise. Talking about, Klaus mentioned uh, just pricing risk. Uh, Dominic mentioned uh, valuation issues uh, uh, and core and yielding strategies coming back. So inflation. Everybody is more or less talking about inflation in, in recently. And some analysts say it's just a temporary phenomenon, it's just a year-on-year -year impact of, of the COVID slump last year. But more and more voices are talking about the medium-term significant increase compared to at least the previous 10 years in terms of inflation levels. Infrastructure's promise was always it's inflation protected. Uh, here is a little vote on, on, on the slide, uh, which we prepared for this to, to test the audience view. Uh, as well on how impactful is, in your expectation, inflation. And we offered three answers, which is not, maybe not easy to choose from, but one is many people I hear say that this is just only a temporary phenomenon, don't worry about it, it won't impact particular infrastructure. Uh, the second answer is uh, infrastructure is, by definition, inflation protected, so there won't be a, no, a material impact on our investments. And the third one is Yes, it is an issue, it, but it will actually increase the allocation to infrastructure uh, because, uh, because of the perceived inflation protection compared to other, other asset classes. There may be fourth and fifth uh, options, but the technology didn't allow us to give more. But could you please vote while I ask the, the, the panel uh, about what, how would they vote if they, if they were sitting in the audience? Uh, I don't know, Klaus, you want to start this time? I think it's really difficult. I would almost take all, all three of them. So I think it's <laughs> temporary, right? I think we will definitely have a period of higher inflation. We can see it already, um, you know, in, in, in construction, in energy, in, in, in really important sectors. We see prices increase a lot. But the asset class is protected, right? Um, I don't think there will be material impact. Um, in general, what we in, in, in the assets we are financing, we make sure that, especially in the long duration core assets, there is a protection against inflation, either in, in, in indexing or in, in a regulated asset class. And um, 
Will it increase allocation in infrastructure? I think not necessarily just because of inflation, but we see in general a, a, a movement from investors into this asset class and, and across the whole capital spectrum. Again, only talking from debt, I guess it's the same on the equity, but, but you know, we're seeing, invest, for different motives, right? We're seeing investors moving into, into high yield just to look for the yield and that short duration, but we see still a massive need for duration at yields, which makes sense. Um, so, sorry, I, <laughs> I would take all three. <laughs> uh, Dominic, you are looking at multiple infra asset classes and multiple strategies. How much is inflation on your mind when you when it, you choose? It is on my mind, but I'm kind of in between B and C. I mean, I'm of the opinion that you know inflation will go. I mean, it's it's. I don't think it's necessarily a temporary thing, but I, I don't know. I mean, I'm somewhere between B and C. I think the risk I'm taking from an equity perspective is really sort of when it comes down to short-term refinancing. I think that's probably the biggest risk for me, and that's potentially where we'll see the impact most. So that will that that how how, how much will it impact long-term business plans if the refinancing environment fundamentally changes? Well, it it has an impact on your business case, right? Yes. But I don't, I don't. I mean, I'm I'm not in a situation right now where I have to refi. So, yes. uh, but it would have an impact, yes. I think, John. Yeah. And I so I was taught in the 1980s that inflation is always and everywhere a function of the money supply, and I doesn't feel like that's really true right now. Um, we're seeing really um, meaningful supply chain disruptions, but I. Like Klaus and Dominic, I feel those will work themselves out as the economy gets back to normal. And I um, think that the pressures driven by technological change and other forces that kept pushing base rates down in North America, in Japan, in Europe will dominate um, over the, the um, short-term inflation that we're likely to experience. And I don't want to position the portfolio that I have to be right with that bet. So like all of uh, us as investors, will be looking um, to, to buy assets at prices where you can live through some uncertainty over refi conditions and make sure that your contractors and your EPC and their subs have good cost coverage um, to address the supply chain issues that they might be facing and that you're not um, facing a, an issue there. I think in terms of tailwinds, um, I like what Klaus mentioned about is, is the rate environment a tailwind. I think also the, um, for fundraising, the strong performance of infra is a tailwind, and our, our first cousin, um, real estate investing, um, in that for many investors, um, their infra allocation came out of their equity real estate, uh, real assets allocation, and we saw people shifting from real estate into infra. I think with work from home and the question marks over office, I think we're, we're seeing more of that, that people are shifting more of their real estate allocation into infrastructure. So I think that's something that helps us a bit with investor demand on the edges. But is this maybe on, on that point, yeah. um, and especially because we have debt and equity here on the yes. panel, which is interesting. I mean, the one danger we could see from inflation, in addition to central banks maybe stopping their kind of massive <clears throat> asset purchases is the refinancing risk on corporate infrastructure. And, and you know, we see obviously right now leverage levels, which we haven't seen, I guess, I have never seen it in my career. Um, but, you know, and, and a lot of, in the corporate infrastructure world, we see a lot of the traditional, you know, bonds which bullet maturities and, mm -hmm. and could that endanger partially? How do you look at it? I mean, we look at it as well, and we're trying to, you know, obviously layer the, the yeah. refinancing risk. But, but it would be interesting to see the equity side. Maybe I'll, I'll start, Klaus, because yeah. I, you know, my origins were in um, infrastructure debt, and that's most of my program. So we're super gun shy about refinancing risk, just because we're so active on the debt side as well. Um, so we do spend a lot of time if we see people with big bullet maturities facing into a merchant period or things like that. Um, but I agree with you, that's definitely the trend in the market and there's more and more debt available and you really have to protect yourself as an equity owner, not take on debt um, that you can't support because the market will give it to you um, if you decide to go mm. that way. I don't mm. know, Dominic, how you no, think I mean, about I, it? I think you said it all. I think it depends on what kind of asset it is and how much debt you can actually afford. So, um, yeah, so. 
And, and this probably leads us into a question that is on everybody's mind, but what does it mean for valuations uh, among different asset classes? Uh, Dominic, earlier you commented that the digital infrastructure is a gross area, but valuations are a bit toppy yeah. at the yeah. moment. You also mentioned a core infrastructure is getting a lot of investment, people running away from negative yield in the, in the classic fixed income sectors, trying to replace it with core infrastructure yield. But that is obviously having a major impact on, on valuations. So how do you cope with that? Um, I mean, I think we had the same discussion around valuations probably three or four or five years ago, right? So I think, yeah, valuations have gone up, but also you have more capital available buying those assets and cheaper capital, right? So, and they have also increased valuations. Um, and I, I think it depends on what kind of asset you're looking at, and also maybe you pay, you know, relatively speaking, a high price. But the question is, what can you do with the asset, right? Can you still get some value, at, value out of the asset? Uh, can you still justify the return? So I think, yes, overall, valuations have increased, but it's also functions of more capital coming into it, cheaper cost of capital. And the, 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 the other factors as well, what can you still do with the asset, right? And how long do you want to hold the asset? Are you just there to yield it? I mean, to get yields out of it for the next 20, 30 years? And then you have a different uh, approach to valuation. If you're just a short-term investor, the question then is if you buy it at, I don't know, 20x or 25x, uh, can you still get the value out of that asset um, for the next seven years? So I think it depends on the on the situation very much. So just to feed back what we see on the screen, we have a vast overwhelming majority uh, agreeing with C, i.e. yes, in, in infrastructure will impact the infra asset class, it will increase allocation to infrastructure and also impact certain infra asset categories. That's a very helpful and interesting overwhelming opinion. Yeah. Uh, but uh, moving on uh, to the last subject, and I'm conscious of leaving some time for questions for the audience, a very quick final round of, okay, we spoke about the immediate post-COVID environment, but if you think about mega trends in infrastructure, investing, and it's not necessarily asset class, it could be that. Topics, themes, style, uh, the sort of secondaries versus primaries, etc. What, what would be the most relevant megatrend uh, in your mind that would drive your investments and asset allocation going forward probably five, ten years? Um, I think, I mean, clearly there's the energy transition, um, but I think also the, I think there's a new generation of uh, digital infrastructure coming, so urbanization is very important, connectivity is important, Internet of Things is important, so I think you see a lot of GPs actually launching uh, infrastructure funds with a sort of private equity return, but they are pushing sort of the urbanization, they're pushing things which are not typically infrastructure, but they're kind of related to infrastructure. And I think this is also a big uh, new theme coming up. So, um, but yeah, there's the obvious one is the sort of connectivity, but also the energy transition is really important, so yep. I think that's, that's yeah. a big mega trend. I, I probably land in a similar place with, I think, just climate change and energy transition is the big, um, the biggest thing going on right now, mm -hmm. and just the proliferation of companies that have announced net zero targets for their operations um, over the last year. Manulife, as an investor, we've committed to take our portfolio to net zero by 2050. Um, we're in line with most Canadian peers on that. I think we trail European peers and we're probably ahead of most US peers in terms of carbon count and carbon reduction. So um, I, it's certainly, um, I've seen the European leadership on climate really now move into North America and this becoming something that our CIO thinks is critical for competitive advantage and something that does invest, uh, does affect investment selection. So um, we're doing a lot of work on continuing to support the 40 billion of green investments that got us here, but looking for new areas that open up opportunities in the future. And maybe to Dominic's point, a lot of those aren't necessarily in infrastructure. Some of those will be information technology and efficiency. And should we get a little bit more venture-like in our program to participate in transformative technologies that'll be supported to help 
get society to a lower carbon profile. So I think there's a lot going on in that space, both in real assets, but also in venture and technology and biology. Can, can I ask you on that? Because uh, uh, in Europe, this whole energy transition investing seems to be far ahead of the US. We see it, mm -hmm. Campbell-Hutchins, we raised our first Article 9 fund uh, earlier this year. We are working on the second one already. But in the US, it, it was, it, the perception in the US is significantly behind in this, mm -hmm. uh, having flown over a couple of hours uh, uh, yes. from there. How, is, it, is it coming with the Biden, Biden administration? I, I think it is coming with the Biden administration, and very importantly, um, much of the action is driven at the state level in the United States. And so even under the previous administration, who didn't particularly care about climate change, state governments were pushing higher renewable portfolio standards and were working coal out of the stack um, in order to address clean air, smog, acid rain, mercury, things like that. So, um, and I, the um, natural disasters that we're having the, in the United States, the severe weather events, that's something that the person in the street can relate to. So I think um, you've got government leadership, states have um, been pushing all the way along. More states um, are getting into this, particularly as the cost of solar um, and wind now come down to be lower delivered cost of energy in the United States. Um, wind at its best and solar at its best are less expensive than, than gas or coal. So all of those reinforce each other. Um, so I think, yes, the, the United States will be following Europe in, in this area and we'll see real action there. And, and, and you. I think it's probably also because <clears throat> investors increasingly want to invest globally, right? And, and so the European investors in the US probably will require certain information for their regulator, regulatory requirements here in Europe. And, yeah. and so that will pull it in a way as well. I think coming back to your question on the debt side, we, we are the new kids on the block, right? I mean, debt didn't exist nine years ago. And, and, and let's say when I mean debt, obviously, yes, we had, to, we had listed bonds, but we didn't have the typical strategy bilaterally negotiated private debt packages and and I think going forward I would see this market to grow up further I think investors increasingly will look into themed topics as we said uh, you know clearly sustainability will be a big topic but you know energy transition uh, digital um, so we'll see much more you know certain strategies focusing on that uh, secondary primary construction risk long duration high yield um, and and with increasing markets also catering for this kind of investor, uh, we would see the market to, to, to develop that and clearly you know, additional, hopefully, regulatory changes facilitating this as well. Um, talking about you know, blended finance in emerging markets, for instance, right? It's something which you know, started maybe um, while well, we did our first bond in, in a fund in, in 2017. Um, we see a lot of development there as well, and interest, and in, 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 in obviously there's a big need in, in, in the developing world as well. And, and so I think you know, there is a constant um, evaluation and development of, of new uh, approaches and, and, and financing opportunities. Thank you, Klaus. So I'm conscious of time, but I think we have, uh, we have deserved a bit of time by starting late. So may, I also would like to open the floor if the audience have uh, sort of any questions uh, here. Please. Gentlemen, thank you. Um, question for you on big themes. We so please introduce yourself just for the benefit of it's, the audience. Uh, Jeffrey Altman. So question for, for you is on big themes, the, the known unknown, which is climate change. And we speak about inflation as well. So uh, we've seen here in Europe, and we've seen also in the States, dramatic climatic incidents, which has impacted infrastructure, which in some cases will require a reinforcement of the infrastructure, as well as uh, crops itself that have been destroyed or, or agricultural prices spiking. So where do you see that from your outlook? How does that look from your investments? Uh, both on the equity and debt side in planning uh, those types of scenarios of hedging against climate risk, if you can, and inflation related to that. Thank you very much. Are there any questions in planned, just to pick? Anybody has other topics? Yes, please. Just to um, yeah. make it more efficient. Uh, uh, Vivek Mittal from uh, Afida, Africa. So that's very far away from what you do. but. Uh, you know, two, two questions and one related to what was just said. 
One is, uh, you know, there was a lot of innovation in the last two crises, the 2001-2002 crisis, the 2008 crisis. There was a lot of innovation after that. What do you see coming down the line after this crisis, to the extent this is a crisis? That you, uh, the second area is, uh, uh, has, the, has the tidal wave of ESG reporting hit you and, and how are you dealing with it or coping <laughs> with it? Very relevant question, thank you. Any other last question? I may have had one in the middle. Yes, sorry, two, two last questions there. Hi there, good morning. Alex Murray from Prequid. Just a quick comment on the term super core and whether you know, infrastructure as an asset class is trying to find a niche between infra debt and core. Thank you. Hello, Laurence Monnier from uh, Aviva Investors. Just to maybe have more focus on the debt and seeing you know, infrastructure having less and less availability of predictable long term you know, subsidized or, or contracted cash flow and more and more leverage, you know, um, and more and more maybe um, corporate type uh, profile, you know, uh, your reflection on that VS maybe highly leveraged transaction. Thank you. So four questions for the panel. Yeah. I leave it to you who take, picks up which question. Uh, Klaus, do you want to take, pick your favorite of those and get, us, get the ball rolling? <laughs> Okay. Um, maybe on the first one, the climate change. I guess we all know, I, I hope at least, we all have integrated ESG um, approaches, how we look at our assets, right? And, and so what, what you mentioned is clearly a key risk we are looking at when we do the due diligence. So is this asset, uh, you know, can it, can it survive, let's say, extreme events uh, in, in, in happening in climate? Um, and, and, and then that almost leads to the second question. This is by regulation now even required, right? I mean, we had to, we went through a huge exercise in going, we have like 100, roughly 100 assets in our portfolio mm -hmm. to, to go back and read the you know, TA reports, et cetera, to, to, for the you know, deals we did in 2013, what's, what's the ESG situation? How would we score this asset to develop a scoring on each asset and, and, um, and to add this into our reporting to investors, right? So the, I would say the, F, the time spent right now on the debt side, and, and I'm, I'm sure it's similar on the equity side, on preparing for what's coming and, and anticipating what's coming, I would say, is, is at least 20, 25% of, of, of my time, definitely, but also of the team to get the information together and to prepare for that. But ultimately, yes, I think it's now an integral part of our due diligence um, to, um, to, to look for those risks in, in climate change. Do you also want to reflect on the last question, which was also about leverage and, uh, and uh, the aggressivity in, in the market? Which, uh... Yeah, I mean, that's that we all face this, right? And, and I think equity gets away with it because they can. <laughs> and, and so it's definitely a borrower, a borrower market. Um, it, it really depends how you set up your platform and where do you really want to focus. Do I want to focus on core assets which are constructed, which just, you know, investment grade and want to refinance that? Probably not because that's exactly where you just, your price taker, you have zero in, impact on the covenants. It's, it's, everybody is looking at that. So what we would look yeah. at is, you know, is there an acquisition? Is there a situation where there's time pressure where the borrower doesn't have time to go to the USPP market, to, to the banks and, and the European uh, institutional market to just you know, where then the borrower needs some more expertise and, and within the debt provider as well to, to, um, to, to make, make the financing happen within the limited time scale. That's really something we are looking at. And then actually you have an impact on, still on the covenants, on the price, and obviously the size of the ticket you can offer is also important. Thank you. Dominic? I mean, I, I don't know, to the first question, I think, um, to be honest, I don't have a perfect answer for that. I mean, I think um, we do the ESG uh, due diligence, but if, it ex ex if things are extreme, eh, no one can predict, right? So I think the only good solution for that is to build a well-diversified portfolio of different assets, different asset classes, et cetera, et cetera. But 
uh, and that's probably my, my, my hedge, so to speak, but um, if it is extreme, I, 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 don't have a, I don't have an answer for that, right? So, um, and also, I mean, you probably will question it twice, whether you would invest in an airport or in a toll road. So I think people need to see how things are kind of settling down, how they're picking up again. And, 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 and I said, as I said before, I think you need to be open for new technologies, right? So, you know, you, you need to invest in other things which are not typical infrastructure assets. They're probably more VC type of assets. So I think a broad diversification of your portfolio would probably help you to get through those extreme conditions. Dominic, you want to reflect on the question uh, about core, super core, and money flowing into the lower uh, returning but heavily yielding uh, categories? But, but the question was around whether there's a trend to it or? I think so, yes. Do you see, I mean, there is a trend. The question is, is this trend continuing in core, super core? That, that, that was your question, if I understood. So, I mean, if you look at it, the infrastructure really started off actually with super core, right? You had open-ended funds and then it, it went out of fashion and no one talked about open-ended funds anymore and suddenly two or three years ago picked up again. So I think it kind of makes sense to have that in infrastructure, the same for real estate. Um, and I think it's, it's it, yeah, it, it totally makes sense and I think the trend will continue to increase. But I think it will be one part of the overall infrastructure portfolio potentially, so you have value add, you have super core. I'm not a big fan of all those categorizations, but I think the, the yielding long-term asset class will definitely survive going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, right. we, we can see really that the, yeah. there's this one institutional buyer who needs the duration, who, who really looks at, well, super core, core, but at, at assets which can provide long, long duration, right? And we are talking, I mean, our, our average, rated average life is around 18 years, 19 years in that strategy. And then you, you have, let's say, different investors like property casual investors or just total return investors. They don't actually want the duration. They want them, you know, they want four, five year, eight years of rated average life, but they want the yield. And so they, they move further down and, and, but you can have, you know, you obviously, you can have full co-financing on super core, which, which then is short as well and, and higher yielding. But so it's slightly different on the dead side. Thank you. John, last chance to conclude the session. Yeah, so just interesting that some public equity analysts are, are forecasting public equity returns of not but 5% going forward. And, and if that's really what public markets deliver, then that will flow into our space and reinforce demand for super core. Um, but yet we see public equity markets are performing well above that. So we kind of have to, that has to show up, I think, before it really pushes investors. I hear some people talking theoretically about um, Supercore being um, a substitute for fixed income because fixed income yields are so low. But I, I haven't really seen many investors actually move money from their debt allocation into um, Supercore that way because the capital you have to hold against an equity position is just so different. So. Um, I think it definitely has a role, as, as Klaus and Dominic have said, particularly if you think utility type assets that are evergreen, perpetual type assets. Um, and then in terms of um, whether Dominic addressed it well, I think we're also trying to invest um, with climate change in mind prospectively. So we invest in farmland and timberland, and those teams take, uh, spend a lot of time looking at um, exposure to weather, Jeffrey. But also in timber, thinking about the value as a carbon sink could be an upside um, to, to the value, you know, the core, the core value of the asset. So we try to fold that in as well. Brilliant. I think our job was to provoke uh, thoughts for the whole day. I hope we have done well on that count. Mr. Chairman, back to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think that was a very insightful panel session. And uh, perhaps if you could show your appreciation for our moderator and panelists. <laughs>